Last time we were here visiting you, we didn't get an interview at the time, but you were doing a video called Cocapelli, and you were, you had just come from, uh, I think it's uh, down south in, um, near Palm Springs, uh, conference. Joshua Tree. Exactly. That you had given a speech about your findings about what's going on Actually, it was in a three terms. Day, four day conference. Okay. Yes. With a but, lot of other researchers. Right. And um, I think maybe David Wilcock was there as David well. David was there. Sean David, David Morton. David was there. Sean David Morton was there. Um, one of my lunar researchers, Steve Troy, was there. Ken Johnson was there. Okay. And I really wanted to be there, but was, it, was not able to be there. But we were fascinated to find out that Richard Hoagland was now investigating what is happening to the planet as we enter what is this uncharted, you know, waters, in a sense, of the future going from now, 2008, we're right on the verge, to 2012 and beyond. And that we understood that you had some evidence that you were working on. And I think David Wilcock has ha actually helped you write. Um, there's an article on your website called Interplanetary Day After Tomorrow mm -hmm. that begins to document the changes that are happening on other planets, not just our own Earth, um, in terms of the heating up of the planets and the changes. And what we want to talk to you about is, what did you find? The way I came to it, and what knits these two apparently disparate subjects together, what has NASA been doing all these years that it hasn't wanted us to tell us? And what is coming in 2012? Turns out to have a very critical, important connection. Remember, I started out looking at a set of Martian ruins. Even if NASA said they weren't ruins, they were just a trick of light and shadow. As part of that work, published in The Monuments of Mars and reiterated in great detail in Chapter 2 of Dark Mission, we tripped over this physics this physics that we are not supposed to know. I was told the other night by an intel source on the phone, and this is an exact quote, it is so striking and so important that I get this right, because it exemplifies what's been going on behind the scenes for all these years in terms of them telling us the truth. I was told that they would rather give up a major American city, Perrin, to nuclear terrorism, then give up this physics. And the physics is the physics of anti-gravity, so-called free energy, even consciousness and life itself. It's all bound up with the fact that physics a hundred and some years ago, when Maxwell was writing his equations and the modern foundations for electromagnetic theory were being laid in England, took a radical wrong turn. And in hindsight now, as I back and engineered this, and we talk about this in, in chapter two, it wasn't a wrong turn done by people who were misled, who were making mistakes, who just didn't know what they were doing. It was a conscious suborning of the truth. It was done by people manipulating science and scientists by controlling the journals, by creating the peer review process, by basically eliminating unwanted papers by attacking character assassination of scientists who were not following the straight and narrow, a conscious herding of the scientific community away from technologies and a fundamental understanding of physics that would liberate all humankind. In other words, control. Remember, I am back engineering this by looking at a set of ruins on another planet looking at some geometry and through exquisitely interesting steps that I won't bore you with now because they're in both books, realizing that we had laid out on the surface of another planet an entire physics, entire window to a whole new way of looking at the world, of looking at reality, of what really controls all the stuff up to and including our technology that we take so for granted and think works one way and in fact works on slightly and sometimes major different principles. So with that as backdrop, as I started looking at the ruins on Mars, and then I expanded my search to look at the ruins on the moon, 
and these little shards of glass and the confirmations that in fact it's all real. All this stuff that I've been saying all these years NASA's hiding, yeah, they have. Then the question if arose, if we're looking at ancient civilizations on these planets that are no longer there, what happened? I mean, if they have this almost magical godlike power, why aren't they still there? Why are we as their last surviving, you know, descendants in the model that they're us and we are them? Why are we in such an awful condition, fighting with each other over a few drops of oil, when the universe around us could provide limitless energy to build the staggering scale of stuff we find on right next door on the moon? Something must have happened. So that got me into thinking, okay, we know from terrestrial history that life does not go on that there in fact are bad things that happen. They happen to people, they happen to cities, they happen to nations, they happen to civilizations. Things have an ebb and flow. There's a, you know, Shakespeare, you know, the seven ages of man, beginning, the middle, and the end to, to you know, collapse it. So if this stuff, no matter how amazing the guys were that did this, if this could come to an end and it looked like it came to in many cases, a catastrophic end. I mean, you look at the stuff on Mars, it's obvious that there was a huge planetary catastrophe that swept this away, that buried it under miles of muds and sediments, and it's been eroding, and we're seeing the traces of, of buildings peeking out from underneath. Even the Russians talk in some of their literature about buried cities under the sands of Mars in their mainstream scientific literature. So you look at all this, and I said to myself, okay, could this happen here again? Could everything we see around us, New York, skyscrapers, you know, the extraordinary technology that went into Apollo, all of the stuff we take for granted, that we're on this unending Victorian march into the future, could in fact it at some point come to an end? Could we currently go through some cataclysm like these guys obviously went through because they're no longer here. So that got me looking at things like ancient records. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying, obviously. But it got me looking at ancient records. I mean, there's some amazing things in Egypt that I can show you. I actually have in this database that really prove that we are not the first. There was this eerie parallel between the face on Mars and the faces of the iconic pharaohs in Egypt, up to and including that headdress, which is called a menes, M-A-N-E-S. It had stripes. If you look at some of the early versions of the uh, Viking imagery of the face on Mars, it's got lateral stripes on both sides of the platform on which the face is lying. That told me that there was potentially an Egyptian connection. Then you fast forward the film and you get into people like Vladimir Avinsky, who was a Russian researcher, who completely separately in 1984 published in Soviet Life magazine um, a, a chronology of his investigation of Sidonia, and he wound up calling the face on Mars the Martian Sphinx. More fast forward to film. As part of my research, when Errol Torin came on board the, uh, the investigation, we realized one day that there was exquisite mathematical linkage between the physical placement of the ruins on Mars and the physical placement of the ruins in Egypt. In fact, the, if I remember this correctly now, the cosine of one was equivalent to the sine of the other. And the odds of that happening were like 7,000 to one. In other words, each special place with a sphinx and pyramids on two separate planets knew the other's location to within one part in 7,000. And that's just not in the cards. That's not, as George Murray <laughs> says, I don't believe in coincidence. Well, George is right. This cannot be coincidental. The more you delve into Egyptian history, Egyptian hieroglyphics, Egyptian architecture, all of the stuff Egyptian, which, by the way, is what the Masons are basing their stuff off of, you find this incredible subliminal connection to Mars. 
Now, when I'm looking at a departed civilization on another planet, whether I have no ground truth, if I can on this planet find linkages where I might have ground truth, that makes me pay attention. So, well, bottom line, there appear to be, both in the mythos, in the architecture, in the math, the geometry, at all levels, some profound deep connection between the monuments of Mars and the monuments of Earth, specifically in Egypt, what I call in monuments the terrestrial connection. And you don't have to have me go into it now because you can go to the books and read all about it, where we document it with pictures and equations and all that. However, that got me looking and really paying attention to a few little blips that in Egypt there may in fact be records, current extant records, a hint of a former high-tech civilization, which in the model might have either gone to Mars and built the stuff we were seeing, although now I don't think that's the case, there's too much stuff there, or in fact have been back, um, what do they call that, blowback, <laughs> although that's a negative term, back where, engineer. where, well not the back engineer, but in other words, the civilization on Mars that we see in ruins could have sent refugees or colonists or whatever to Earth, and then you would have a, a, an independent development where they would develop high civilization and you might see on Earth the record of that ancestry reflected in the monuments. One case in particular was what we see on the screen. This is Abydos, which by the way is a very critical planet in the whole Stargate mythology around the very popular television show. And that raises the question, what do those folks know and when do they know it? <laughs> this is Abydos. What's striking is this is the temple of Seti I, who was one of the Renaissance pharaohs. He wasn't, he was kind of like in the middle part of Egyptian history about 1500 years ago. He was, he was a Renaissance guy. He basically was looking back to the beginnings of his culture, his civilization, and he had the power and the money and the ability to order his guys to basically find the good stuff and build monuments affirming what great guys those old original founders of Egyptian culture were. And he built this temple uh, at Abydos. Now, the thing that's striking to me is when you look at the facade of this, what does it look like to you? It looks to me modern. It doesn't look ancient. Mm -hmm. In fact, it looks really, really modern. In fact, I'll tell you what it looks like. It's a big, massive, five-sided building on the other side of the Potomac called the Pentagon. <laughs> if you look at the Pentagon at ground level, it looks like this, including the columns, which are made out of concrete. These are made out of stone. When you go inside, that's where the real surprise is because inside, up on the lintels, one in particular, that ho are holding up the roof, you see this amazing uh, freeze of what looks initially like hieroglyphs but in fact appear to be high-tech stuff. Like, here's a helicopter, here's a tank, Here's an obvious anti-gravity spacecraft with tail. Here's a land speeder. I mean, this looks exactly like Luke's land speeder from Star Wars, all right? And you've got some other things that look more like iconography, um, maybe letters, maybe some kind of hieroglyphics. They don't look Egyptian. And what I did was to simply lay out the comparisons right here. Now, anybody who looks at this says, oh my God, you mean the Egyptians had battle tanks and Cobra helicopters? No, that's not what we're saying. What I'm saying is that, here's the Abrams tank compared to the, the tank here. What I'm saying is that this ancient culture, spearheaded by Seti I, looking back through his own sacred records, his own sacred texts, his, his documentation of what is called in the Egyptian um, the first time, which is a chronicle of some extraordinary era that occurred before then contemporary Egyptian civilization, that he was memorializing the amazing guys that did and could build and preserve this stuff. And so what I think Seti was doing, Seti I, was he was basically building a museum 
to memorialize the technology from the time that came before, from the first time. The Shensu Hor, the followers of Horus, who are this lineal priesthood that kept track. And if you look at uh, Manith Manitho's um, chronology, his calendar, you see these enormous swaths of time that conventional Egyptologists dismiss as, you know, silly, you know, misidentification of lunar cycles for years and stuff like that. But you're talking periods of time that equal like 10, 20, 30,000 years in a chunk. If you run that whole clock backward, this period of time could in fact have been contemporaneous with whoever built what we're seeing on Mars. And the anchoring piece of real science is that when you look at the Giza Plateau, when you look at the pyramids from the top down, edit, look at the Ball and Hancock's reconstruction that the stars and the belt of Orion mimic the pyramid placement at Giza. And you look at how those pyramids are aligned almost, but not exactly, on due north. If you take a very simple clock, which is the plate tectonics in standard geology now, and you unwind that clock of the plate rotation of Africa due to the physics of the planet underneath Giza, it turns out that the architecture of the Giza Plateau and the time frame for whoever built Sidonia is exactly the same, a quarter of a million years. Okay. Which means... We have looking, 28 minutes, just so you can okay. get a gauge. Which means we're looking at an incredible civilization that came and is now gone. Are we talking about Atlantis? Metaphorically, yeah. In other words, if, if you read Plato, if you read the actual story of Atlantis, I think scholars, and this is my personal opinion, have been too narrowly focused on one place, one island, one night, one catastrophe, that in fact what Plato was referring to, because he was, remember, listening to the priests from Egypt through Solon. He got all his stuff about Atlantis from the guys that did this stuff. He was talking about an era, about a civilization, about a culture, not one little spit of land where a bunch of guys did something really wacky and were beaten down by the gods. Atlantis is a concept, not a place. Atlantis, to me, is the time that came before, which may have been included guys who could go to and from the moon, to and from Mars, lay out all the stuff all over the other planets and moons that we have found with great, great effort through the NASA database, and which is waiting to be confirmed by some honest space program that will give us all the truth someday. Leading then back to the inevitable question, if all this stuff once existed and now is all gone, what happened to them? And the answer in the physics is that the physics can go wrong. It can go horribly wrong. It can go wrong on a solar system scale. That's why we're seeing Mars in terrible, terrible ruin. That's why we're seeing ruins, not skyscrapers that you can recognize instantly, on the moon. And then the question has to be, can it happen here? Which then moves our attention sideways to the Mayan calendar. Because the Mayans, one of those ancient cultures, contemporaneous with the guys who were memorializing this stuff, they have right in their own text, there will be a date and time when this will all go away and something brand new will be reborn. Now, is that just metaphor? Does it apply to consciousness, a new way of looking at the world? Is it new age, airy, fairy, oh, we're all going to love each other someday? Or does it relate to the possibility that in this physics there is a set of ticking time bombs to where if we don't take this knowledge, this physics, this technology, all the secret classified black ops stuff they've been sitting on for 50 years, if not far longer, that we will be in deep, as President George Bush Sr. said, doo-doo, when the day of reckoning, uh-uh, 2012, December 21, 2012, arrives, and we are totally unprepared for what might happen. And again, I said earlier that politics is 99% perception. To my mind, 
there are two questions here. One is, what's really going to happen? And I'm working with enterprise and researchers like Joseph Farrell and others to try to figure out the physics. And the other track is political. It's what do they, the controllers, the people who have literally suborned history, kept us from knowing our real history, completely suppressed current history, given us a fake script. What do they think is going to happen and what are they doing to get ready? Oh, and by the way, not telling any of the rest of us. <laughs> right. Okay, can you answer your own questions? Gosh, I hate it when I have to answer my own <laughs> questions. <laughs> there is a physics. We are actually picking up some very interesting hyperdimensional slash torsion indications that aligning the Earth, the Sun, and the galaxy, which happens once every 26,000 years, has an effect, has a real physical effect. The question is, how much? We also have evidence that the in crowd, you know, the Rockefellers, the, the um, um, you know, the De Beers, the Diamond Guys, the who's Illuminati. The other, uh, well, we're talking White Scott. Bilderbergs. Now. The Bilderbergers, the, all those groups, all those really, really bad guy groups people love to hate now, that they know something. Or more accurately, they think they know something. And they have been taking steps for the last hundred years to get ready. What's really interesting to me, and this was so cool when I figured it out and I was able to lay it out at the Joshua Tree Conference which is not the first place that I've been laying this out. I've done several conferences now under almost like focus groups to see how people you know, would stand up and salute when they saw this data. When Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, one of the things he brought back was stuff from the Mayan calendar, Mayan codices. We are told they were burned, right? Wrong. <laughs> I think they were sequestered in the Vatican archive. Who in their right mind, if they're around sopping up stuff, is going to destroy information Forget the fact that they're not religious, that they're into saving their own skins, that they're looking for edges on society and politics and populations, and it's all about control. The cover story is, of course, if they're burned, there's nobody who can look at them anymore. So you can look at them in secret. So I think all these codices that the scholars lament, oh my God, they burned them, oh, they were so bad. No, they went back to the Vatican. The reason I know this because the only way this could have worked out is that in 1582, when a German scholar, Germany again, interesting, was set up by Pope Gregory to head a council to reform the calendar, because the seasons had gotten out of sequence with Easter and Christmas and birth of Christ and resurrection of Christ and all that. I mean, it really, you know, you can't have Christmas in, in July, and that was what was going on. So the calendar had to be reformed from the old Julian calendar. So Gregory sets Clavius, who's the German mathematician genius, to head this panel, you know, this presidential committee, if you want to think of it in those terms, to basically recommend changes in the calendar. And when all was said and done, they came out with a calendar which readjusted the dates, the seasons, the times, brought everything back in sync, it's called the Gregorian calendar. We live under it now. It took a while for it to percolate through various parts of Christendom and parts of the world that were not Christian and all that at the time. And so in 1583, it was set ahead 11 days. What's really interesting is if you look at the synchronization of the Mayan calendar and the Gregorian calendar, this very crucial date of 2012, According to the U.S. Naval Observatory, you can go to the web and go log on the Naval Observatory website, which is www.navy.gov.observatory or something like that. Google is your friend, so look it up on Google. And you will find that the magic moment, the Mayan moment when the world changes, doesn't end, but changes radically, is December 21, 2012, at 11.11 11 a.m. There is no way that can be accidental because 1111 is a code for the physics we've decoded from the monuments of Mars. And that's a long story, which we don't have time to get into now. But it's on the Enterprise website and it's in the books. It's in Dark Mission. It's in monuments so you can go and read. The point is there's no, there's no way that 
Clavius, Gregory's surrogate, with this German interesting secret society heritage, could have done this unless he either had an independent source of knowledge about calendars. It was much more sophisticated. I mean, I've had a mathematics professor who was the head of the department at Fairleigh Dickinson University, which is a Catholic university in the United States, actually write on the record that he could not figure out how Clavius did this. It's too damn precise. So my supposition is that it was the secret codices brought back by Columbus et al, sequestered in the Vatican with the Mayan calendar, where they were able to adjust the Gregorian calendar so it would come out at 11.11 a.m. the morning of the 21st, 2012. Okay, so what happens? Oh, I was afraid you'd ask me that. <laughs> I don't know. You're, are you working on that? I'm working on it, of course. It's a work in progress. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what I don't know. I could tell you what I suspect. Okay. But because the, the implications are so serious and the amount of effort being spent by the bad guys is so great, I strongly infer that it's not going to be a good hair day for a lot of people. <laughs> But I okay. cannot take that to the bank yet. Sure. There are various ways that this could be changed radically. One way is if the guys in the black ops community who are playing with their secret toys, their secret spaceships, their secret space program, going to and from, looting the moon, finding the libraries, doing God knows what they're doing out there, if they suddenly realize that this technology is actually applicable to entire worlds, that there's a physics here that can literally take control of the planet and prevent bad things from happening. That would be really cool. Because the thing that would get us in the end is if there's a real problem coming and there isn't a damn thing we can do about it. Fortunately, based on all kinds of evidence, including the folks that you guys talk to all the time, everybody inside knows all this stuff. It's just us peons outside that are not supposed to know it. Right. which means nothing has to be invented. All it has to be is redirected from over here, whatever they're doing with it, to over there, which is the planetary problem. And our job is to get people on the inside to realize they don't have a ticket out of here, mm -hmm. that they're caught with all the rest of us. That we're in it together. We're all in it together because the lie has been different at every level. And even if they've been told they have a ticket to leave Dodge, they probably don't. So they have families and aunts and uncles and dogs and cats and mortgages and all that stuff, and they will be here when whatever is coming in 2012 based on a physics that I can document is here. Okay, well, we have a scientist who is talking to us very briefly for a moment. He came out and he said there are going to be three events between now and 2012, and he is a well-regarded scientist, someone you would know, and perhaps you've been talking to him. We don't know. We can't name him. Okay. <laughs> and he says, one is a CME, a coronal mass ejection from the sun. Uh, and Bill, you got to help me with this. The second is a magnetic pole reversal. Okay. And said, finally, a pole shift. And he said that these events will begin in 20. Uh, a nine and culminate in 2012 and then he wouldn't tell us any more because he said he was constrained by national security clearance and we were the first people we'd spoken to outside of the national security community for the last uh, seven years and it was only because we recognized his name and said are you we he paid us a compliment he sent us an email and, and we got into a, a small dialogue now we are being approached by all kinds of people some from black ops mm, aren't um, we all? With, yeah <laughs> with secrets to tell as well as remote viewers etc etc and they've all got information about what may be coming down the pike from between now and 2012 mm -hmm. we just went to russia and interviewed bariska the child with past life recall of a life on Mars, who started talking at the age of seven, and we're going to be releasing that interview fairly soon, um, basically saying Moscow is going to be inundated by water in a very matter-of-fact tone, 
um, and that it's going to happen in 2009. He doesn't know at this age of, of like 11, he doesn't know why or how. Um, he just knows it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we're getting all kinds of evidence. There is evidence of underground bases, of preparation um, to put, you know, certain groups of people in safe places and let the rest of the people, in fact, something on the order of two thirds of the population, you know, just wing it and basically, <clears throat> you know, That's go by the wayside. That's probably a very large underestimate. Uh, it's an underestimate. Okay. Now, all of this, we don't like to believe that this is going to happen mm -hmm. or that some cataclysm is so massive going to hit the earth in such a way that between, you know, that these events are going to cause, you know, total destruction and the end of human life. Um, but well, we're being let approached. Me, let me it's, so it's so not we're the end, asking It's not you, the end of human life. It's the end of this cycle of civilization. And we will go on, the human race will go on, and if past evidence is, is accurate, which it is, there will be a new cycle, there will be a new set of cultures and civilizations, and we'll be the myths of their minds and their scribes and their sages, and they will someday develop spaceflight, and they will go to the moon, and they will have people who will keep the truth from them, and the cycle perpetuates ad nauseum, unless we stop it here. So the name of the game, all of us who are looking at this from various facets, like the elephant, that's why the elephant is sitting over there, is we all need to combine our forces, our resources, our knowledge base, our goodwill, and most of all enlist you guys out there watching this and change the script. The tools are there. I now know the tools are there. No matter what is, quote, coming, it can be dealt with because the physics is so extraordinary. The problem is political and spiritual will. And there's a small group that want us, in the worst case scenario, to all go away. So they're not solving. They're not lifting a finger to solve the problem. In fact, they are perpetuating the illusion, the lie being different at every level, that there is nothing that can be done. In fact, from our research, there is an extraordinary amount that can be done. In fact, it can be, it can be stopped. It can be changed. The, the first way that you conquer an enemy, and to them we are the enemy, is you make them conquer themselves. You make them give up. You make them want to stop fighting. You tell them it's hopeless. Remember um, the, uh, the uh, guys in Star Trek, you know, the Borg, you know, Fighting them is futile. Resistance is futile. Well, it's not. That is another level of the lie. Okay, so if you can take the next, you know, what will we have, you know, 15 minutes and tell us in some kind of form or fashion what kind of technology or what kind of physics are you talking about? Are you talking about time travel? Are you talking about, it's hyperdimensional physics, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Um, what is it that you see as the solution? And you know, I know that you've been working with David Wilcock and he has a very positive attitude towards the future. Is his positive attitude coming because of research you guys have done together or because he has some of the same sources that you have? It's a bit of both. It's, it's you know, okay. we, he st the reason I got intrigued with Wilcock is because he was independently coming up with some of the same stuff we were coming up with. And I love independent confirmation. And that's the life's blood of real science. When somebody separate you've never talked to presents you with a database and my God, it looks kind of like your database and you never talk to each other. So that's how Wilcock and I got together. We have worked together. We have developed joint information and sources and we've done, you know, some publications to try to get the word out. In terms of what to do, again, I'm not certain that even the best and the brightest of the in crowd knows what's really going to happen. Because I found so many instances where they're working off these old texts, these old ancient documents, these rituals, and they obviously haven't a clue about the real physics behind them. So they could literally be spending all this money which they're stealing from us, which is trillions. They could be building their huge underground cities like in the Urals and in, in Russia. 
They could be doing their seed bank, which they're doing, remember, up in Norway? Yes. They've got this, you know, socked away for the... I mean, it's all there. You can see what they're doing to get ready. But suppose they're being misled. Mm -hmm. Suppose they're not reading the physics correctly because they don't know there's a physics. It's so compartmentalized that the guys that are working with the physics are developing these neat spaceships and all that stuff, or the energy sources. They're not talking to the political folks that we're seeing or making these other decisions because, remember, it's secret, secret, secret. They would rather give up a major American city than release the secret of the physics because if they do that, they totally lose control. And their purview, their paradigm, their whole reason for existing is all about control. So that they can't do, they can't go there, they can't say, Maybe we're wrong. Maybe we haven't read this right. I mean, no one has called me up on the phone lately from deep inside and said, hey, Uglin, what do you really think is going to happen? Unless you guys work for them, in which case it's a very <laughs> elegant technique. <laughs> the point is that you have to go by the numbers. And the numbers tell me at this point two very important things. One is it's not a date. It's not going to happen at the stroke of midnight on September 21, 2012, or 11, 11 a.m. That's part of the synchronized ritual. That's a reinforcement that this is really based on the physics because the code is 1111. 1111 is actually, I'll tell you the, the answer and then you can go and back engineer how we get there. 1111 is a code for 19.5, which is the key geometry of the upwelling physics of every planet in the solar system. So that tells, it's like the swastika, it's like another version of imprinting something, an imprint, that this is really physics-based, HD physics-based. Okay. So, there are two tracks using this physics to avert what is to come, if there is something bad coming. One is technology. I strongly suspect that HARP, in fact, is one of the positive technologies protected by all the stupid lies all around it. I mean, the worst case scenario, you know, the mind control and the, <laughs> they're doing, you know, they're doing this, they're bombarding, people with M-rays, you know, all this stuff. No, it's to protect what HARP's real raison d'etre is, which is to try to work with plasmas in the ionosphere, because plasmas are a key to controlling torsion, torsion waves, and torsion waves are the 3D etheric manifestation of the HD physics in this dimension. So you got a huge multi-gigawatt transmitter working with plasmas upstairs at the poles. Now we find the Russians are very interested in both poles. They've sent an expedition to the North Pole, that Putin did something very curious this past summer, and they also sent a not-so-secret intelligence guy in charge of their intelligence activities to the South Pole. Now what was that all about? Well, it's because the poles are the secret to controlling the Earth if it wants to flip over. So someone somewhere is actually working on a technology to prevent the worst case scenario. That's good news, because they live here. That means at least one group isn't going to try to leave Dodge. They're actually working to solve the problem. And I can point to, there are some other cute aspects of HARP that we don't have time to get into, but they're on the web and they're in dark mission, and they're just so amazingly cool, affirming that some group actually is looking to solve the problem for all of us. And that's only with the physics and technology we can see. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes that we're not seeing, okay. that's classified. In other words, they could, as I, as I told one neocon some years ago, when I was having this discussion with him, and it was really amusing because this is somebody that lives, he's a very high level banker, go to the money, follow the money, which I did. He lives right next to George Bush down in, in Houston, all right? So he's obviously, intimately involved in that set of conversations. And I laid out exactly at that point, which was several years ago, what I thought might happen, not will, but might. And he looked at me and it was the most, it was, it was the second most intriguing thing that had been told me after, after Gene Roddenberry's statement. He looked at me and he says, but you realize, Hoagland, that you'll get no credit for this. <laughs> and I said, what? He says, well, this has to be done in secret. Nobody could ever know. I said, go do it. <laughs> to hell with credit. Just go do it. And so things are being done. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have to know 
if what's happening. We don't know the need to we don't need to know the details. We just need to know that someone's you know Bill O'Reilly, someone's looking out for you. And I think there is a component. Remember, it's a fiefdom. Nobody's all in sync. They're all at war with each other. And there's some component that says, holy cow, my, my wife doesn't have a ticket. Maybe I should do something for the planet because she's going to be stuck here. Mm -hmm. So someone who wants to have his wife stick around for a while. Sure. So the other track, which frankly is the more interesting track to me, and it's been slowly coming up, you know, the race analogy on the inside, on, on the inside rail, you know, horse races, is the consciousness track. Because Art and George and I have been doing these consciousness experiments mm -hmm. on coast for years. Mm -hmm. We have demonstrated that there really is some undefinable, invisible ability of a mass of people focusing on the same objective to affect 3D reality. Mm -hmm. In part, I am sitting here because of that focused technology from art with the Coast audience who, when I had the heart attack back in 1999, apart from all of Robin's ministrations and the homeopathics and her, you know, instantaneous immediate intervention, over the longer term, for that critical first week or so, when art was focusing people's consciousness on me, there was a difference. I really believe that that intervention in that critical first few days really was critical in getting me over that crisis and then Robin's long-term you know supplements and all the other things that she had me doing and I was eating 10,000 pills per day that all of that ultimately wound up with me having not one problem sitting here in perfect health 10 years after that event so I got to thinking for obviously personal reasons what if we could harness that technology, that invisible mind connection to work on this same problem. And so we've been discussing quietly with George how we would set up some more controlled experiments. And there was one recently where I forget who it was who wanted to do something and had put up a countdown clock and George had his audience focus on it. And sure enough, the Princeton eggs these random number generators that have been set up under the Consciousness Project at Princeton University actually showed an effect. On time, on schedule, when people at a certain time of day, I forget when it was, um, were focusing on the experiment. Suppose we were to lay out in some large media format, in theater, on television, specials, whatever, this is the problem as we've determined it. These are the windows of, of vulnerability where intervention would be useful. And then we give people simply the database that this has worked over here. It can also work over there. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we, in, in the process, we democratically empower ordinary folks, in quotes, all over the world to collectively put aside their isms, their differences, their my God is bigger than your God nonsense, and we focus together as a collective human family to solve potentially the greatest problem in the history of the human family in this iteration of the world. And suppose it worked. That's our challenge. And that's why I'm doing what I do. That's why I wrote the book. And that's why I'm hoping you're enjoying what you're hearing on this program. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's very impressive. So you're taking, you know, in a sense, Ingo Swan was able to affect with his mind this thing under, you know, with the help of, of SRI and Hal Yeah, the so-called magnetometer that. experiment. Exactly. Yeah, he actually fiddled with it and confused the hell out of them. And, and, they and said, it was supposed know, to be absolutely, no, impossible. you couldn't do it. But see, it's torsion. It's all about torsion waves. The, the Soviets, the Russians, back when they were the Soviets, have 50 years of a database of this is a real physics, which again has been suppressed in the Western world. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring these two cultures together. I mean, isn't it interesting that we had so much positive response to our Washington, D.C. National Press Club press conference? We had four Russian networks show up. We had a Russian network show up in this living room and sit here with me in the screen showing some of this stuff 
which is going to be beamed on NTV, which is the largest commercial Russian television network, to 120 million Russians in the next few days. If we can build bridges between two cultures that have a database that shows this is real science, this is real physics, this cannot be suppressed provided ordinary folks forget the authorities who have been lying to them and they listen to the folks that are trying to get them to see elements of the truth. And then, of course, they have to do their own homework because you can't sit and listen to me and believe me. You can't. You should not. But you have the net. You have Google. Google is your friend. Everybody say after me, Google is my friend. You can now cross-correlate from so many sources that you will get a gestalt that most of what I'm telling you is in fact verifiable and therefore real. And if that's true, you can't sit there on the couch watching television any longer. You've got to go out and do something because 2012 is coming. Okay, thank you very much, Richard Hoaglin. Um, this has been really fabulous. Camelot thanks you, and we hope to return to interview you and Farrell and continue the story. One of the problems of publishing a book like Dark Mission is credibility. When you make claims, even claims based on evidence, even claims based on a NASA source like Ken Johnston, they are always open to interpretation by many, and they're certainly open to attack in terms of the credibility of your sources. In the last few hours on Amazon.com, there has been a review of Dark Mission published by a former NASA flight controller, who not only affirmed that most of what we have put in Dark Mission is correct, but he has also told me through this public venue that there used to be a time when I was doing Coast or doing Bell that the flight controllers would be listening to my expositions on various NASA activities and that the flight controllers themselves had put all this together as a compilation in the Johnson Space Center Library. And then, after a period of time, probably 10 years ago, that tape disappeared. He was disturbed. He went looking for the tape. He then found that he was instructed to stop looking for the tape under penalty, penalty not specified. James Oberg, who is NASA's current defender and who has been attacking Ken Johnston viciously, um, wrote a response on Amazon claiming that this person was making unsubstantiated claims, that he in fact was uh, blowing smoke. And then a few hours later he posted a second review where he affirmed that in fact this flight controller is exactly who he claims to be. Something is changing.